Welcome to On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm Newsom, and I'm here to break down the pay-per-view that we've got coming up this weekend at UFC 297. Two title fights, we've got the UFC middleweight championship on the line and then the vacant women's bantamweight championship on the line as well. It's a really good card, it's in Canada as well, fair few Canadians on the card, so... It's an event that looks really good on paper. I think there's some real, real good fights. Some that I think are flying way under the radar. So I'm looking forward to digging deep, getting into these fights and breaking them down. And just before we get started, if you do want to get involved this weekend in some betting and gambling activity, remember, always gamble responsibly. You can do so at MMA Play 365. We've got the breakdowns. We've got... The official bets from myself, we've got Bayes AI from our UFC prediction software, we've got new features with Bayes AI as well, the top six feature where the AI is now automatically generating the top six picks so you don't have to go through it all yourself, but also providing the Bayes AI implied odds on the percentages that we provide and then giving you a rough overall price of what Bayes AI thinks that that parlay, accumulator, multiple, wherever you're whatever part of the world that you're from you'll say that differently but yeah it'll give you an overall price of the parlay and then you can then go to the bookies and compare the percentages that are already converted towards to the bookies odds and seeing where you're getting value so plenty going on at mma play 365 like i said if you want to get involved if you do want some activity from a betting perspective just to increase The enjoyment on the night, if you are a fun gambler, of course, if you're a long-term gambler and you've been following us and tailing the official bets, then of course you'll be involved anyway, but you can do so at MMAplay365.com. We've got plenty of different subscription types. We've got a next event subscription, which is just $5. You can pay monthly at just $10 a month, or you can buy the year at $100. And for that, you get everything as well. Like I said, you get the handicapper side, you get the Bayes AI prediction side as well. It's all in one place. And like I said, that's at MMAplay365.com. But now straight into the breakdowns, as always, we kick it off with the main event, the UFC middleweight championship fight between Sean Strickland, the current champion, versus Drakus Duplessis. This is a really good fight. Obviously, it's now... Got some bad blood. These two engaged at a UFC event. I think it was UFC 296 just before Christmas. And yeah, they went at it in the crowd a little bit. People got involved. It's just created a little bit more hype around the fight. I genuinely think that Drikus Duplessis is just having fun winding Strickland up. And because of that, I think that Strickland just really doesn't like Duplessis now. So there's bad blood in this fight, I think more on the Strickland side. So yeah, it's definitely a fight that is very, very interesting and even more interesting from a stylistic perspective. But like with Strickland, you've got to hand it to Strickland. That performance against Israel Adesanya was just, you know, I think it was a once in a lifetime performance if I'm being honest. Look, I'm not taking anything away from Strickland when I say that. I just feel that that was one of these world-class performances that I'm just not sure can be replicated. And the performance I actually compare this to is, if you guys remember, and maybe you don't remember if you've only just started following MMA in the UFC, but when Cody Garbrandt absolutely schooled Dominic Cruz, not many people gave Cody Garbrandt much of a chance of beating Dominic Cruz, and those that did give him a chance, most of those guys thought that, look, if Garbrandt was going to win, he was just going to knock Cruz out. I don't think anybody really anticipated Garbrandt going out there and absolutely schooling Dominic Cruz for five rounds, you know, dropping him multiple times and all that stuff. And ever since Garbrandt did that, he's never been able to replicate a performance on that type of level. And I kind of feel that the same thing is going to be said of Strickland in the next, you know, after the next few fights. I'm just predicting it quite early. And of course, I could be wrong, but look, everything went right for Sean Strickland in that fight. He had a perfect game plan. He went out there, stylistically caused a massive problem for Adesanya. I mean, Adesanya is one of the world's elite MMA strikers. And not only did Strickland out-volume Adesanya, but he also dropped him and like I said, over five rounds beat him on a decision. And again, I just don't think many people would have predicted that either. So it's going to be tough for Strickland to replicate that type of performance just because it was such 
a world-class performance and one that we're going to be speaking about for a long time coming. But as always, styles make fights. And look, in my personal opinion, I don't think Duplessis could have gone out there and performed to that level that Sean Strickland did and beat Adesanya. I don't think Duplessis would have beaten Adesanya or would beat Adesanya in that type of fight. So again, you've got to hand it to Sean Strickland. But as we keep saying, styles make fights. And the thing is with Duplessis, I think that, he, look, he's a real middleweight. He's a big middleweight as well. And if we hadn't have seen the Robert Whittaker fight last time out, then this prediction probably would have been a little bit different because... Look, what Duplessis did to Robert Whittaker, not many fighters do to Whittaker. He went out there, he dominated him in round one. It was a slow-ish start from Duplessis, but he finished on top of Robert Whittaker, you know, smashing him, cut him up, and then came out in the second round and just continued where he left off, you know, and it's just that real smart fight IQ, you know. He hurt Whittaker off a jab. Like, if you look back at that, it's pretty much a jab. And then Whittaker got back up and then he turtled up against the cage and instead of Duplessis just unloading at the face, when Whitaker's hands were up, he went down to the body. And, you know, Duplessis is a really well-rounded fighter. Not only has he got his striking game, which is a kick-heavy game as well as a real hard punch game, but he's also got good takedowns. He's got a real good grappling game. He's heavy on top. Like I said, he's a big middleweight. He's got sneaky front choke submissions as well. So his, when his opponents are getting back up, he's threatening with legitimate chokes. And I do think that he's a complete package as a fighter. The one sort of... I wouldn't say red flag, but the one question mark I think that are, that I think is on a lot of people's minds is the cardio, especially over five rounds. Like, what does Drikas Duplessis look like in this fight if this fight does go into a fourth and fifth round? The thing is with Duplessis, I feel like he's got this weird cardio. Like, you go back and watch the Brad Tavares fight, and Duplessis looked like he'd absolutely gassed out badly at the end of round one, but then round two and three, it was, it was fine. His cardio kept at a similar level, his output was good, and he ended up beating Tavares over three rounds. And then it comes in the Whitaker fight, and everyone's talking about this no surgery that Duplessis had. Apparently, he's never been able to breathe properly that was going to impact his, you know, his gas tank and his cardio. So now that he's got that fixed, his cardio is going to be even better against Whitaker. High output round one, relatively high output, and for as long as it lasted in round two, he still didn't look like he was breathing too heavy. So maybe. We've got at least three and a half, four rounds out of Drikas Duplessis. Maybe, maybe we've got a full five. You know, if it's a real fast-paced fight, then, you know, we'll see. But look, Strickland doesn't put that type of pressure on fighters where he's causing them to work really hard on the back foot. And, you know, it's quite a steady pace with Strickland. I think that the pace is going to be set by Duplessis in this fight. The range management is going to be set by Duplessis because of that as well. And... Duplessis, Duplessis should be able to control how fast this fight goes, which is going to be an advantage for him. The one issue that I saw from Duplessis in the Whitaker fight is Duplessis was getting hit a lot by these jabs. So Whitaker was pu pumping out a jab, a really good jab, and the head movement from Duplessis was minimal. His head was on the center line for a lot of these jabs. And that's a concern in this fight for Strickland because one of his best weapons is his jab. And he will pump out 100 plus strikes, no problem at all. Most of them will be jabs. So Duplessis has got to be very mindful of that. The other side to this, and this is another concern from Strickland's side, is that he does jab too often, and sometimes judges don't score these as significant strikes. In my opinion, they should. But you go back and look at the Cannoneer fight. Strickland lost that fight on a split decision to Jared Cannoneer. He landed more volume than Cannoneer. But the problem was that most of those strikes were the jabs and the judges just didn't see that as you know fight ended intent and the shots that Cannonier did land I mean Cannonier didn't land as many hard shots as what he normally does but the ones he did land that you know he landed more hard shots shall we say and the judges liked that a little bit better because the fight in the fight ending intent was more on the side of Cannonier. so sometimes this jab heavy volume game from Strickland can come back to bite him and again in a fight 
with Duplessis, who throws everything hard that does have power. I do worry for Strickland, even if he gets up on the numbers. If this fight goes five rounds, even if Strickland's landed 150 strikes to Duplessis 100, if most of those 100 strikes from Duplessis are hard fight intent ending fight ending intent shots, and Strickland most of his shots are jabs, then the judges are likely to look at Duplessis more. Then from a finishing perspective, I think that the likelihood of Duplessis finishing Strickland because of those hard shots, he does have the finishing upside there as well. So I actually think stylistically it's going to be a tough fight for Strickland. And then we haven't even gone into the wrestling and the grappling yet. Like Strickland's a good wrestler and, you know, he's wrestling and grappling with guys like Magomed and Kalayev that we see. So we know he's got a level there, but Duplessis also got a level of wrestling and grappling as well. And even if he's not overly successful with it, just mixing things up, breaking the flow of striking by shooting the takedowns, maybe getting Strickland down for a second before Strickland pops back up. It's just altering any flow state that Strickland gets in. Like I said, stylistically, I do think it's a fight that looks good for Drikas Duplessis. Duplessis does beat Strickland and then becomes the champion and then goes on to Adesanya next. Then, of course, that's a different level of opponent, a different stylistic matchup. But right here, I think that Duplessis has got to be careful that he doesn't get out volume too much by the jabs, move his head. But I think that he's good in this fight. I think he's got power. He's well-rounded, good strike, and he'll mix with kicks. Should be better at the different ranges. And I do think that he's going to set the pace in this fight, which is going to help him mix in a bit of wrestling and grappling. And I think we're going to see a complete performance from Duplessis. So for those reasons, I'm picking Drikas Duplessis to win this fight and become the new UFC middleweight champion. And now we're moving on to the next fight, the co-main event and yet another UFC championship fight, this time for the vacant women's bantamweight championship. We've got Raquel Pennington versus Myra Bueno Silva. Really good fight, both women on five fight win streaks. I don't really care what the no contest says for Myra Bueno Silva against Holly Holm. She finished Holly Holm with a ninja choke. Really, really good performance and you know, finishing Holly Holm is something that's very difficult. Not many fighters have done so. You know, Myra Bueno Silva, I feel like, is coming into her own a little bit. Whereas Raquel Pennington, you know, she's been around for absolute years. She's always been around the top of the division. She's fought some of the best fighters in the world. She's fought pretty much every best fighter that you can possibly imagine. And Pennington's going to be bringing into this fight that experience and that veteranship. And the thing is, she's still up there in regards to performing against the highest level of competition. And the one thing that Pennington does really well, I actually tweeted this about Andrei Arlovsky last week, and that's just slowing a fight down and being able to make the fight and a, the opponent fight at her pace. And that is a very slow pace. It's, you know, it's not going to be fast and furious with Raquel Pennington. It's just going to be nice striking ranges, you know, mixing the kicks up with the hands, Short combinations, tying up with the opponent against the clay, against the cage, making it ugly and grindy and just running that clock down, doing just enough for the referee not to separate them. It's that type of performance against Pennington. And, you know, I bet Ketlin Vieira against Pennington last time out. And I, even though I thought that Vieira did win the fight, Raquel Pennington just showed that that's exactly what she can do because, look, in my opinion, Vieira is a better quality fighter, but what Pennington did was just make it ugly, slow it down, grind against the cage and, you know, made it so Vieira couldn't get her game going and that's what she really does well. The thing is with Myra Bueno Silva, the problem you've got to be careful of with that is, look, Holly Holm tried the same thing and look what happened there. She ended up getting choked out. Now, granted Raquel Pennington, she's only had one submission loss on a record. That was back in 2012 against Kat Zingano. So we're talking about a fight 12 years ago and she hasn't been submitted since. So that's going to be an interesting factor. With Myra Bueno Silva though, she's from a youthful a youthful perspective. She's got that youthful energy. She, you know, she's still, in my opinion, getting better. She's got good striking herself. I think the striking range is going to be very even. I think where Pennington's going to have the advantage again is if she closes the distance, starts making it dirty, ugly, and grinds away at Silver. Silver might have to fight against a really veteran performance here and 
you know, experience experience matters for a lot inside the cage. But other than that, look, I do think that Silva's the better fighter. She's the fighter that's on the rise. Like I say, coming off a submission win against Holly Holm, she's got a dangerous submission game herself. So does Pennington try and take her down? Again, I feel like... Myra Bueno Silva is going to be the better grappler in this fight. If she's on bottom, then maybe Pennington does a better job, but there's still going to be some danger there. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure that Pennington does try and take her down. I think it'll be more of a case of just, you know, holding Silva up against the cage. But then when we come back out at range, Silva's got good striking, good straight punches, will mix in kicks herself. And then, like I said, maybe mix in some takedown attempts for herself and look to try and, you know, make things uncomfortable for Pennington. It's one of these fights where I kind of feel that Pennington only wins in one way. And look, that one way, there's, you know, a, a good path to victory there for Pennington. But that one way also includes stalling a fight and making it ugly and grinding, like I've said numerous times. Whereas when they do separate, if bueno, Myra Bueno Silva is doing a good job with the strike and then the judges are going to favour silver more from the striking perspective and actually taking the fight to pennington opposed to pennington just trying to slow things down and make it ugly the judges tend to lean the other way more often than not so i think that again you start putting everything together i think that silver's got more of a judges friendly type of style i think that the striking's going to be close at range i think from a wrestling perspective it might go to pennington but silver's got ways of getting fights down to the mat and she's going to be a better grappler as well so there's probably just a few more ways for myra bueno silver to win because of that i feel that she's going to have multiple advantages in different areas i think the finishing upside is more with her from at least a submission perspective and then even if the fight does go to a decision like i said i I feel that she's got more of a judges friendly type of style as well so i think there's a lot coming together for bueno silver in this fight i think it's a good fight for her i think it's a fight that's going to really test her but ultimately get the best out of her and i think that's what's key if Silva can just stay off the cage and not get, you know, held there for long periods of time. I think she'll be okay. But remember, this is a five-round fight, not a three-round fight. So there's going to be plenty more opportunities in a five-round fight for Silva to get out of their exit, disengage, and then start to get her own game going. Wherever, whereas if it was a three-round fight those windows become much smaller and it becomes much more difficult. So I think the five round fight favors Silver more in this fight, in this specific fight, than what a three round fight would. Everything put together and picking Myra Bueno Silver to win and become the new women's bantamweight champion. And in the next fight, we've got Neil Magny versus the home country fighter Mike Malott. And actually just... Coming back off what I've just been saying about Raquel Pennington, which is also what I tweeted about Andrei Arlovsky at the weekend, the ability for a fighter to really slow a fight down and fight at their own pace and cause their opponent, even if they're a high volume, high activity type of fighter, slow them down too. Neil Magny does exactly that and it must just be a veteran you know, a UFC veteran move of just, you know, the years and years of fighting, just being able to, you know, create a situation where they can control a fight and how many times have we expected a Neil Magny opponent who was on the rise high activity good finishing rate to come in there and really put it on Magny and then when you watch the fight Magny just slows everything down makes it ugly gets against the cage uses some dirty wrestling when I say dirty wrestling I just mean the grinding type where you're against the cage for like a minute and then suddenly a takedown or a trip comes out of nowhere and you're on your back and then you've got to get back up to that position that you were just struggling in initially, that, that type of wrestling. We've seen it a million times from Magni and it's almost one of them where you just start to second guess yourself when, you, when it's coming to the analysis and making the prediction because ultimately we've seen it so many times against opponents that should beat Neil Magni and look, Mike Malott is that fighter. He's a fighter that should beat Neil Magni. And is it going to be another Neil Magny fight where Mike Malott can't really get anything going and suddenly is against the cage and suddenly has lost a couple of minutes of, of the round and then that couple of minutes turns into three minutes and then we're into the next round and suddenly Mike Malott's not got anything going and he's struggling to get his reads and get into the open space. Is it going to be that type of fight? And look, it's a possibility, but I like Mike Malott a lot. <laughs> I really didn't intend to, to put those together, but I do... 
I do like him a lot. I think he's a great fighter and he's also well-rounded. He's big, he's strong, he's physical. So if Neil Magny does try this approach of, you know, pushing him against the cage and trying to control him, I think Malot's going to be okay. Where it might become difficult for Malot is if Magny does get these sneaky takedowns and starts getting a little bit of time on top. But I think I think Malot is a very physical fighter. He's strong and he'll be able to match the strength of Magny. The, the strength and the physical aspect is always difficult to predict in a fight because, you know, there's no analysis on if one fighter is going to be stronger than the other. I mean, some in some cases, you know, you just know by looking at the, you know, the size and the, the physique of, of each fighter. But when they're very similar, it's always it's always a bit of an unknown of who's going to be stronger. But I do think Malot can match Magni in regards to the strength, get out of those positions against the cage and then... Look, apart from that, look, if Magny's not getting in close and grinding on Malot and pushing his back to the cage, I think Magny's in real trouble because Malot, in my opinion, is the better striker. I think he's got good volume, but he's got good power as well, and he'll really mix things up from the punches to the kicks. And then if Malot gets on top of Magny, this is where Magny's always had his problems. Like, Magny's great topside, but when he's on his back, he really struggles. And Mike Malot is a very good topside grappler. So I kind of feel that, Malot is going to be better, he's going to be much better on top of Magni than Magni is on top of him, and then when it comes to the striking, at least out in the open space, I think that Malot's going to be dangerous, I think he's got a massive finishing upside, like I said, and very similar to what I've just said with Myra Bueno Silva, if Malot just stays out of these clinch positions where the opponent, in this case Neil Magni, is trying to just control the, the clock, run the clock down, and just grind away... If he stays out of those bad positions, it should be a very comfortable fight for him. And I think, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be as comfortable for Silver as what it would be for Malot, you know, when I'm comparing those two fights together. But for this specific fight with Mike Malot, I think that he's so much better than Neil Magny as a fighter. He's just got to stay out of those grinding positions. I think he does that, or if he does get in the positions, he can reverse quickly use his physical strength, get back out into the open space. The crowd's going to be buzzing for him as well. He'll be the last Canadian fighter to fight on the night. So the crowd's going to be going wild for Malot. And I think that's going to just ultimately just create some real intensity on Malot's side. I think Malot is going to be able to put some nice strikes together. Again, I think the finishing upside's massive in this fight, even if it's not a knockout. We've seen what Mike Malot can do on top of his opponents. You know, a great arm triangle submission against Lane S last time out. And I think that Magni could be in trouble on the mat as well. So big finishing upside for Malot. I think the striking is going to be much cleaner, much more powerful than Magni. The grappling is going to be much cleaner, much more dangerous than Magni's. It's just stay out of those clinch positions and you'll be fine. For those reasons, I'm picking Mike Malot to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Chris Curtis versus Mark andre Barrio. So another Canadian fighter that the crowd's going to be popping for on the main card. But look, I think that this fight is going to be a bit of a levels fight, if I'm being honest. It's, you know, it's something that we talk about from time to time about there is levels in MMA. And I kind of feel that Chris Curtis is just a level above Mark andre Barrio. I'm not saying that, you know, Curtis is light years ahead of Barrio. I still think there's going to be competitive moments in this fight, but look, the the level of competition that Curtis has been fighting and the experience that he's got, I just think that he's just going to be too much in there for Barrio. Like, look, I don't like what Curtis did last time out against Imarvov. I've got my own opinions on that. I think that, you know, Imarvov was looking great in that fight and Curtis knew he was looking great. And I suppose you can never really question exactly what was going through Curtis's mind you know it might have been genuine but just from the outside looking in looked a little bit you know a little bit naughty from Curtis so yeah look I don't like that but in regards to Curtis as a fighter I think he's a really good fighter you look at the Kelvin Gastelum fight you know he went to war with Gastelum I do think he would have beaten Gastelum without that accidental clash of heads as well that ultimately caused the judges to score that round to Gastelum, thinking that Gastelum had dropped him when in with a with a a legal strike, which obviously he hadn't. So, yeah, I think that Curtis is 
going to have some real advantages in this fight. The hand speed, I think, is going to be a crazy advantage. I think Curtis's boxing is clean, it's sharp, and even though Barrio can strike, his strikes are a little bit slower, a little bit more laboured. They come out probably with a little bit more power initially, but the combinations are much slower, whereas Curtis can put real fast combinations together. He'll rip to the body and the head. He's just so comfortable when he's standing and striking inside boxing range, which I think Barry will absolutely be fine with that. Like, I don't expect to see many much wrestling or grappling. I mean, Curtis has never even attempted a takedown in the UFC slash contender series. Mark andre Barry, he attempts very little takedowns. I think he's got like a 25% completion rate as well when he does shoot a takedown. Curtis has got like a 90 plus takedown defense rate. So yeah, I think that, this fight is won and lost on the feet. Barrio, he's got power. He could land on Curtis and knock him out. But look, Curtis has got a good chin. He's got good defense. He covers up well when his opponents are striking. And I just think it's going to be one of those fights where Marc-Andre Barrio does try and come forward a lot. He'll love the crowd on his side. But Curtis's combinations and his hand speed, I think that is you know, it's super sharp. And it's a big advantage over Barrio in this fight. I think that... He's got the ability to put combinations together and hurt Barrio also, you know, really start to crack Barrio as he's coming in, make Barrio question himself inside the cage a little bit. If Curtis loses this fight, I imagine it's going to look something like the Jack Amanson fight where his inactivity is just not there and, you know, he's... Sorry, he's, he's inactive he's inactive, and the activity levels just aren't there and he's just getting struck on from the outside and he's getting a little bit frustrated that the opponent won't engage i think it'd be that type of performance but i i think there's a massive difference a in the style between hermanson and barrio but also in the quality of fighter as well you know i don't think barrio's at that level yet and again it comes back to a levels thing if curtis doesn't win this fight i think he's going to have really dropped the ball because it's a very very winnable fight for him um but look, Barrio in Canada, you know, he's got some power. Could he frustrate Curtis, you know, make that activity level drop and, you know, really take the fight to him? Maybe. But Barrio, at the bare minimum, is always in close fights. Like even the Eric Anders fight, which he won unanimously, those rounds were really close. And again, you look at the difference between Curtis and Eric Anders, I think there's a big difference there in quality of fighter. And if Barrio's going close with guys like Anders, even though he's winning, then, you know, I just think that, again, Curtis is just that level above that mid-tier division that mid-tier area in this division where you've got your barrios and your eric anders and those types of fighters so yeah i think if curtis doesn't win this fight he's probably dropped the ball somewhere along the line for those reasons i'm picking chris curtis to win this fight and in the next fight, this is the fight that I think is flying way under the radar. Hopefully throughout fight week, it starts getting a little bit more attention. But at the minute, it's, I've not seen this fight get much attention at all. We've got Arnold Allen versus Movsar Ivloev. Arnold Allen from the UK, 19-2 and record. Movsar Ivloev from Russia, 17-0 and unbeaten record. This is as high level as it gets in the UFC. I'm telling you stylistically, from a skill set perspective, this is the fight to watch on the entire card. Arnold Allen, great, well-rounded type of style, good striker. Takedown defense at one time was a little bit in question, but he's got good jujitsu. He can get back up to his feet. He can threaten chokes whilst doing so. He's also not that easy to take down, or at least he hasn't been since the Mads Bunnell fight, which at this point was years ago. And he's a very different fighter now than what he was back then. Movzar Ivlowev, well-rounded himself, predominantly a wrestler though, great wrestling, great grappling. This is a guy that was on the floor with Diego Lopez for long periods of time. And sure, there were some dangerous situations, but... If Lopez isn't submitting somebody in the UFC, then the likelihood of somebody else submitting that fighter is very slim. So, look, Ivlowev's got good grappling, and like I said, he's got a good wrestling game to go with it. I th like, he's a good striker as well, but look, the way Arnold Allen struck or was striking against Max Holloway, yes, he didn't beat Max Holloway. Yes, Max Holloway outlanded him. We all know, you know what Holloway is capable of, but at least... In those first few rounds, you know, Arnold Allen was looking really comfortable on the feet. He wasn't getting ran through like Holloway does with a lot of fighters. Holloway is normally the pressure fighter, at least in the early moments of that fight. Arnold Allen was 
the one putting pressure on Holloway, pushing Holloway on the back foot. Holloway can just strike moving forwards and backwards extremely well, though, and ultimately that's what caused Allen's striking to be nullified a little bit. But Arnold Allen is a very sharp striker. He's looking huge for the division nowadays as well, so he's got power. And if Evolev tries to stand in front of Arnold Allen... If this is a 15-minute kickboxing fight, Evil Web doesn't beat Arnold Allen, in my opinion. Allen will get up on the strikes. He'll land some hard punches on Evil Web. But because of that, I feel like it's going to force Evil Web to strike. Even if Evil Web thinks to himself, look, I'm going to test my striking for the first round, for example. I think that when Arnold Allen starts getting off on his strikes, I think the first couple of minutes, Evil Web will bail on that and just start looking for the takedown. And I think it's going to be one of these types of fights where Allen's going to start off really well striking. Evil Web's going to get his wrestling game going. I think he's going to take Allen down a couple of times. It's going to, he's going to have to work for those takedowns for the first couple of times. But also after the takedown, I think Allen bounces right back up to his feet again for the first couple of times. But the longer this goes on in the fight, the more I feel like it's going to get a little bit easier for Evloev. I think the takedowns will come with slightly less energy required. I think he'll slowly start to accumulate more control time on the mat with each takedown as well. And the longer the fight goes on, I think the more... Evil Web really starts to to take over it. It's a tough one because, look, like I say, Allen's got real good takedown defense. He's got a good get-up game. He's the better striker, in my opinion, in this fight. But I just don't think that Evil Web stands and strikes for too long with Allen. And if he tries, he'll learn very quickly that that's not the way to go. And then what does he do? He goes back to, you know, his second nature, his bread and butter, which is his wrestling. And then that's when I feel like you'll start to see a little bit of a change of course in the fight. But look, if Allen can actually, if I'm wrong and Allen can defend these takedowns and get, or if he is taken down, just continuously get straight back up a little bit like the Bautista and Ricky Simone fight last weekend. If Arnold Allen can have a performance like that where he's not allowing Evil Web to keep him down for too long and then suddenly the striking starts really becoming a bit too much and then the takedowns are shot from a little bit too far out, they're not getting set up properly, then we could see a very you know similar performance, like I say, to what Bautista did against Ricky Simone last weekend. Like Arnold Allen's that good, and at 19-2, and two it proves it. Look, this is a phenomenal fight, a world-class fight. It's as high level as it gets, but I do have to side with the 17-0 and 0 unbeaten Russian. I just think that path to victory is stronger, is the strongest path to victory in the fight. Yes, Arnold Allen, you know, would outstrike Evloev, in my opinion, potentially hurt him, knock him out, but I think Evloev's wrestling is the equaliser here. I think it's the strongest path to the victory, and I, again, he's unbeaten for a reason. For those reasons, I'm picking Mavzar Evloev to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Brad Katona versus Garrett Armfield. And I feel like this is going to be another one of those fights where it's, look, it's just extremely well-rounded. Both fighters can strike, wrestle, grapple. Both fighters like to grind. And it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. Brad Katona, again, you look at his last fight and it's very similar to what he does in the cage. Like, he can start really well, but at some point in the fight, or even if he's not started the best, but at some point in Katona's fights, things start to get real close. Things start to get a bit like, okay, Katona looked great at the start, but now things are starting to even up a bit. How was that round scored? What's it going to look like in the next round? Then suddenly it's gone three rounds, we're going to a judge's decision, and there's a couple of rounds that are maybe 50-50, and you're not sure exactly which way the judges are going to score it. And... That's a problem for Katona. I, what I'm basically trying to say is that at a certain level in the UFC, he struggles to really put his stamp on a fight, and that's therefore force, forces the fight to be relatively close. And the thing is with Garrett Armfield, I kind of feel Armfield's a pretty underrated fighter. Like His striking's good. His bread and butter is with his wrestling and his grappling, and he can grapple. Uh, sorry, he can grind on his opponent as well. And that's what makes things close with Katona. I think Katona's going to be the slightly better striker here. I think Katona might try and wrestle and grapple himself, but I'm just not sure he gets the better of Armfield in the wrestling and grappling scenarios. I think Armfield is going to be the fighter that you know is more is is stronger within that wrestling and grappling area. So I kind of feel it's a little bit like, look, both fighters are going to be competitive striking. Both fighters are going to be competitive wrestling. Both fighters will be competitive grappling as well. 
I give the very slightest of edges to Katona striking and the wrestling and grappling, I give the very slight edges to Armfield. Of course, if one fight is on a good night and one fight is on an off night, then, you know, that can be completely thrown out the water and the fighter that's on the off night is just not going to be as on with the, the advantages that they would normally have over the opponent. Potentially, something that could happen here, could happen in any fight, sport, game, match, you know, in the world is is what happens with athletes. You can have good nights, you can have bad nights, but from the most part, I think these two are really well matched, and I think that Armfield is going to make this fight a little bit ugly. I think he can just take Katona down. I think Katona will pop right back up, and Armfield might then start, you know, using the cage to get around the back and sinking a hook in and just making it difficult, and ultimately just grinding from that wrestling and grappling perspective without actually having to hit big double legs or single legs and take Katona down. It's just going to be a really close fight. I don't anticipate a decision, and therefore, if it does go to the... Sorry, I don't anticipate a finish, and therefore, if it does go to the scorecards, I think we're going to be left sat there thinking, well, this fight's close. It could go either way. Armfield's the underdog, so in that type of situation, you know, the value would be on Armfield. I just feel that, again, it's going to be a close fight. The match, They match up really well everywhere, striking, wrestling, grappling... And in these 50-50 fights, more often than not, I'm going to side with the underdog. So for those reasons, I'm picking Garrett Armfield to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Charles Jordan versus Sean Woodson. So again, talking about levels, I kind of think this might be a little bit of a levels fight as well. Like Charles Jordan just seems to be better, even if it's just slightly in every single area than Sean Woodson. What makes it difficult here for Jordan is that Sean Woodson is so big. He's tall, he's long, he's unorthodox, he's got a weird style in regards to striking, movement, stance. And he's going to be able to hit Jordan from ranges that Jordan's probably not been hit from before. So Jordan's definitely a fighter in this fight that he's going to have to do more work. He's got to do more work because he's got to close the distance, he's got to get inside... He's got to be in striking range. If Jordan sits on the outside, then he's just going to get picked apart by Sean Woodson. But the thing is with Jordan, he's an aggressive forward pressure fighter. He loves a scrap. So he's going to be a fighter that is moving forward, that is going to be trying to be aggressive. And the thing is, once Jordan breaks that range distance and gets into that boxing range, I think he's going to chew Woodson up. I think the, you know, the kicks to the body, to the legs, I think the punches, the combinations inside of boxing range, even if Jordan tries to level change and take Woodson down, Jordan's grappling game is severely underrated. Like when people talk about Jordan, they talk about him being this, you know, elusive striker and, you know, really, really exciting and fun to watch from a striking perspective, you know, high energy, lightning fast, but Man, you look at his grappling game and it's something you have to take seriously. I wouldn't be shocked here if this fight hit the mat and Jordan submitted Woodson. But this is what I mean about the levels. Like, I think Jordan's the better striker. I think he's the better wrestler. I think he's the be definitely the better grappler. And if he's top side, there's going to be danger. On the feet, if he breaks that range and gets into boxing range, there's going to be danger for Woodson there as well. It's just with Woodson, he's so tall and long and fights in such an awkward way that you can cause problems for everybody. But when you're looking at picking a fight and making a prediction, it's it's something that I just don't think you can pick Woodson, just because I don't think Woodson's better in any specific area. It's just his physical attributes as a fighter. It's what is going to make things a little bit more difficult for Jordan than what it would be if Woodson was like, you know, five inches shorter. So yeah, I think it's a tough fight for Woodson. Jordan will come in with a good game plan. He'll know exactly what he needs to do in there. And he's just a better fighter in every single area, in my opinion, which causes a fight to more or less to be one-sided I think Woodson will have some moments but once your once your Dan figures him out I think it's going to be a tough one for Woodson so for those reasons I'm picking Charles Jordan to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Seri City versus Ramon Taveras 2 it's a rematch I'm just going to apologize straight off the bat if I start calling Taveras Tavaras I've been having real problems with this so yeah if I if I slip into Tavaras, I, I do apologise. It is Tavaras though. It's just we've had so many Tavaras in the UFC. You become you become accustomed to you know to certain things. So look, this is a rematch, and it's a, initially it was a bit of a strange rematch when you know when I saw it. But then when you actually go back and look at why they're doing it, it kind of makes sense. Like this is actually 
Tavares is actually City's last opponent that he fought in the contender series that he knocked out in round one. So you're thinking, well, look, these two guys have fought in the contender series. City's knocked him out in round one. Why on earth, A, is Tavares signed to the UFC? And B, why are they fighting again when City literally just knocked him out last September, I think it was. So when you actually look at it and, you know, look at everything that surrounds it, look, it was a controversial stoppage. And I do agree that it was a controversial stoppage. City did drop Tavares, but then the referee jumped in way too quickly to to stop the fight. Tavares was looking right at City. I don't think that he was, he was obviously hurt. He was dropped, but I don't think he was dazed or rocked. I think, you know, there's a good chance that Tavares would have got right back up to his feet. I mean, there's also a good chance that City lands a couple more shots and puts Tavares out as well, you know, especially after just dropping him. But the fact that we don't know is the reason why they're making this fight because Tavares actually stepped back into the contender series a month after that in October and knocked out Romeus, who was this high-level wrestler that everybody expected to run through Tavares. So Tavares has earned his spot in the UFC. I think the rematch makes absolute sense. And... It's it's another it's a good fight that we get to see again. Look, Serious City I think is the more well rounded fighter. You know, fighting at Niagara top team with guys like Malot, Jasmine Jasvadicius. He he does a lot of training with his wrestling and grappling. We just don't see it so much in his fights. We just know that the ability is there. Seri City is a really relaxed striker. He's not a fighter that puts too much power in his strikes. You know, he likes to rack up volume. He'll rip to the body and the head. Whereas Tavares, Tavares, sorry, see I did it. Whereas Tavares, he will rip to the body and head as well, but he's definitely more of a a boxer, a power puncher that does try to really hurt his opponents, whereas City will try and break his opponents down methodically. And if he doesn't get the finish, then he'll just run with the decision, which is almost also a reason why it was quite surprising that he was the one that dropped Tavares in that fight. Because if you said to somebody pre-fight, someone gets dropped and knocked out in round one, you'd be putting your money on Tavares. So I think that with City being a more well-rounded fighter, I think it definitely gives him an edge in this fight. And look, Tavares is a one-dimensional fighter, but that one-dimensional gets even narrower as well because he's one-dimensional in regards to him being a striker, but he's also a boxing-heavy striker, so he doesn't kick too much, whereas City is more of the complete package. And the thing is, even even when these two guys have exchanged hard punches and gone toe-to-toe, even though Tavares is the more likely fighter to land more power, it's actually City that we've seen drop Tavares. So... I just think it's, look, it's hard to rule Tavares out because he's got a load of power, but I think City is is very smart, he's got good fight IQ, he doesn't rush anything, he won't be baited into these crazy exchanges, but when he did get into the exchange with this guy, we've seen him drop him already, and then if City decides to mix things up and go with the wrestling and grappling, I think he's got advantages there as well, so all in all, I think City's more well-rounded, I think he can win in multiple ways, multiple paths to victory, and we've already seen him at least drop Tavares and finish him according to that specific referee as well. So whenever you, when you put everything together, yes, Tavares is live for a knockout. But if that knockout doesn't come, if he doesn't land on City, I think City's just the better fighter. So for those reasons, I'm picking Seri City to win this fight. And in the next fight, this should be a grappler's delight. We've got Gillian Robertson versus Pollyanna Viana. And I think it's really good matchmaking for the reason I've just said. Look, you know, I, I love these grapplers, grapplers versus grapplers type of fights. More often than not, it does end up it being a 15-minute kickboxing fight. But in this specific fight, I, I don't think it's going to be like that. I think that we are going to see grappling. I think we are going to see scrambles. And we are going to see who is the better grappler. And look, I think that one of the advantages that Gillian Robertson's going to have here is even if the grappling's close, I think she's a little bit stronger, a little bit more physical and because she's the better wrestler, I think there's more chance of her being on top. And because of that, again, you start adding in the physical side of, you know, the grappling exchanges as well. I think Viana's actually in a difficult fight here. I think Viana, from a straight up jujitsu skill set perspective, is very close to Robertson. I think from a striking perspective, both fighters are very close. But the the part, the two areas for me that are going to give Gillian Robertson you know, a great chance of winning this fight is the the wrestling advantage offensively. And then once she's on top, I think she's going to be a bit bigger, a bit stronger, and it's just going to cause problems for, for Viana because it's not as if 
Robertson is, you know, a white belt or a blue belt going up against Pollyanna Viana, who, who does have really good high level grappling. And then Viana can sort of negate the physical attributes of Robertson, you know, cause sweeps and reversals and just, you know, be the far better grappler. Robertson's a legitimate grappler herself. And like I said, when you're a legitimate grappler against another legitimate grappler, the one that's heavier on top, that's more physical with better wrestling has just got the better chance of winning the fight. I think for Viana to win this fight, she's either got to keep the fight on the feet or get there first with the wrestling. I don't think a wrestling's going to be good, in, good enough to get Robertson down, if I'm being honest. And with the striking, I don't think she can stay at range too long before Robertson's level changing and closing the distance herself. So yeah, look, stylistically... I think on paper it should be a great grappler versus grappler fight, but I think what we're actually going to see is Robertson being able to shoot takedowns, get on top of Vianna. Even if Vianna gets back up, I think Robertson can reshoot. I don't think Robertson's going to be in too much danger from anything that Vianna throws on bottom. Like I don't think Vianna's going to armbar or triangle Robertson from bottom. I'd be shocked if that happened. And because of that, I think we're going to see Robertson with a great performance here. So for those reasons, I'm picking Gillian Robertson to win this fight. And in the next fight, another Canadian on the Canadian card. We've got Johan Lainess versus Sam Patterson. Sam Patterson moving up in weight to welterweight. Interesting move up. Obviously, you know, we suffered a real bad knockout last time out. And it was one of those bad knockouts where he was out for a long time. And, you know, he's had a long time off as well. He, you know, I think he's he's done the right thing, not gone straight back into it and risked, you know, potentially breaking his, his chin and you know, having chin issues moving forwards. Maybe that they've put the the bad knockout to down to the fact that he was cutting too much weight. I mean, we don't know that side. We don't know what he walks around at. We don't know how much weight he actually cuts. And even if he does interviews and says that he walks around at this and cuts at that, you know, you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. No fighter's ever going to reveal, you know, the intricacies, the exact intricacies of, of things like weight cuts and training and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we don't know how much weight he was actually cutting and that could have been a contributing factor to why he was knocked out so badly in you know in in the way that he was but moving up in weight's interesting he's going to be cu cutting less weight but also he's going to be giving up more size so he was massive for a lightweight tall long and always that had had that advantage over his opponents now he's moving up in weight he's not going to be as tall as some of the fighters he was fighting at the lower weight and also the opponents are going to naturally hit a little bit harder than the fighters who were fighting at the lower weight as well so although there's some potential positives in the move up to welterweight there's definitely some concerns as well and then the other concern is look low Johan Lainess packs a bunch so if Sam Patterson does get hit hard again even if he's rocked and not fully knocked out does he panic you know does he go into a shell and cover up you know it's all things that we, we don't know and then the other concern with Sam Patterson from a stylistic perspective when you watch him fight is look the weight might have been a contributing factor to why he was knocked out so easily but he does leave his chin exposed. He's got a bit of that tall man's defense. And, you know, you look at the the last time he was knocked out, he was knocked out in a very similar way, you know, hands low, moving backwards and gets caught and knocked out. And he's got to fix that aspect of his game. It's all well and good moving up in weight to, you know, not have as tough as a weight cut to be more hydrated and to be able to take a better shot. But you don't want to be forcing yourself to take a better shot. You need to be fixing the reasons why you are taking those big shots. So there's definitely that concern. But I'm more concerned in this fight for Patterson of the strike and defense than a bad chin. Because I do think that he was caught on the button. I do think it was a bad knockout. It can happen to anybody. I'm not going to assume that his chin's absolutely shot until I see it shot again like if Johan Leoness comes out in this fight lands the first big punch on Patterson and knocks him out clean and cold then we can start having some concerns about the durability but I'm more concerned about the strike and defense the thing is with Leoness I've got massive concerns with Leoness as well because he initially was a type of fighter that would come out hard would come out fast and if he you know packing power into every punch that he throws and he just doesn't have the gas tank for it and he, when, when he doesn't find the knockout and his opponent does weather a storm, he then gasses out so badly he can't even perform to the level he needs to, to perform at, at this level in the UFC and then gets beat and probably knocked out himself. Then he had that one fight against Darian Weeks where he... I actually bet Lainess in that fight. I 
I bet Leoness as an underdog, I believe, and I thought that look he's gonna tone it down a little bit and just land the hard shots when he needs to. But what we actually saw is a very close decision that could have gone either way, and Leoness was massively outvolumed in the fight. He didn't pack any real power into any of his punches. He paced himself way too much, so completely at the opposite end of the spectrum, and because of that, didn't put out enough volume, didn't really land anything that was going to worry or hurt his opponent, and got away with a very close decision. So you've got two sides to lay an S. He either has a low-volume decision, which if he does that against Patterson, I think Patterson absolutely pieces him up. And if Lane S doesn't throw anything hard at Patterson, then Patterson's not going to got to worry too much about you know the defense or the durability. But then if Lane S does come out hard and take tries to take Patterson's head off and doesn't take his head off, then Patterson pieces him up with the, you know, the longer the fight goes on with having the cardio edge and the volume edge anyway. So although there's massive concerns on Patterson's side, in my opinion, which, you know, I've already mentioned, I actually think this isn't a bad fight for him because I don't think Lane S has found that middle ground yet between the pacing and the power. I think it's one or the other, and I think either of those, I think for Lane S, it's probably better for him to come out and try and take pa Patterson out really early because if he doesn't take Patterson out, because if, if he doesn't come out and try and take Patterson out early, I think he's going to get pieced up long-term over the three rounds, potentially finish late as well. I'd, I've got to think that Lane S comes out hard and fast and tries to take him out. And I'm just going to always side on, well, more often than not, I side on the fighter, whether in a storm and, you know, the opponent gassing out, trying to take the opponent's head off. And then, you know, that opponent who's gassed out just gets pieced up and loses the fight down the stretch. I always tend to, well, not always, but most of the time I tend to side with, with that type of fighter. So, look, I think Lane S, if he does actually crack that ability to be able to mid-range it so throwing some power punches but you know also putting some good fundamental strikes in there and trying to keep up a little bit of activity and volume as well I think Lane S absolutely batters Patterson but I, I just I haven't seen it yet I've seen either one or the other and I think Patterson there's a good quality fighter in there he's just got to fix up his defense and we've just got to you know hope that the chin hasn't taken the damage that you know, we hope it hasn't taken. And look, like I said, I think there's a real good fight in Patterson. He came to the UFC with hype for a reason. I think he's well-rounded. I think he's really good. I think that he's got a real cardio advantage here. I do actually like the step up in competition. Cutting less weight is always a good thing or cutting more unnecessary weight is a good thing. He's just got to fix up the defense. If he, fix up the, he fixes up the defense and weathers a storm that I believe he's going to have to weather, I think it's a good fight for him. So for those reasons, I'm picking Sam Patterson to win this fight. And in the next fight, yet another Canadian. We've got Jasmine Jasvidicius versus Priscilla Cachoeira. And yeah, look, I think it's going to be a tough fight for Cachoeira, if I'm being honest. Look, from a striking perspective, she's probably got a very slight striking advantage, putting the pressure on, you know, being that zombie, walking forwards, taking shots to landing shots. And we've seen Cachoeira land some good knockouts as well. So from a striking perspective, it's not like light years away, but I do think Cachoeira's got the very slightest of advantages. But where I think Jazz Vidicious has got huge advantages with the wrestling and grappling, and that's where I think the fight is going to play out. I think Jazz Vidicious will activate the game plan. I think she's going to cause Cachoeira a massive problem. I think whilst Jazz Vidicious is on top of Cachoeira, she's got plenty, she should have plenty of opportunities to land some good strikes, to look for submissions. She's got a finishing upside whilst the fight's down there as well. I just don't envisage a scenario where either Jazz Vidicious doesn't try and take Cachoeira down or Jazz Vidicious tries to take Cachoeira down and Cachoeira defends takedowns and keeps the fight standing. I don't see I don't see any of those scenarios playing out. I think Jazz Vidicious is going to shoot takedowns. I think she's going to get the takedowns or even at the very worst, if she doesn't get the takedowns, just grind on the cage, run the clock down, make it dirty, make it ugly. But ultimately, I think the fight hits the mat. I just don't see a scenario that where where that doesn't happen. And the more Cachoeira is taken down, I think the longer she spends on her back. And it's just going to be one of those types of fights where I think that Jazz Vidicious has got a huge stylistic advantage here with the wrestling and the grappling. That'll be activated and it's going to be a tough fight for Cachoeira because of that. So for those reasons, I'm picking Jasmine Jazz Vidicious to win this fight. And in the last fight of the breakdown, which is actually the first fight of the night, and 
I think it's a really good fight as well in the flyweight division. We've got Malcolm Gordon versus Jimmy Flake. And it's such a good fight stylistically where both fighters are at as well. Both fighters are coming into this fight on two fight losing streaks, losing against two very good opponents, each of them. Malcolm Gordon definitely losing against the better of the two opponents. So Malcolm Gordon's lost against Mokayev and Jake Hadley, whereas Jimmy Flick's lost against Charles Johnson and Alessandro Costa. But ultimately, regardless of how you level and compare the opponents that they've both lost to in those last two fights all four of those fighters beat both of these guys anyway you know if Malcolm Gordon was fighting Charles Johnson and Alessandro Costa I think he loses those fights and of course obviously Flick loses against Mokayev and Jake Hadley so it's a perfect fight this I think both fighters know that the back's against the walls a little bit Jimmy Flick it's a real shame what happened to him obviously he got into the UFC got the win and the finish against Cody Durden which is a great win you know in hindsight now and after that win he retired he said he'd done everything he needed to do and I think he maybe lost a bit of motivation I don't know he got to the UFC got a win and that's it off he went and very very surprising because at that point Flick would have gone into a really good fight next time out he'd have been a favorite everybody was really high on him and suddenly he took time out, came back to the UFC, and I think, I don't know whether he lost a lot of momentum or just a, lost a lot of that high-level skill set that need that you need to be in the UFC within that, you know, retirement break that he had, but it does look like he's been playing catch-up since he's come back, but, you know, you've got to, you've got to hand it to Flick, you know, it's, it's not as if he's been losing fights that he should be winning you know he's lost against two opponents that he was supposed to lose against at least from a bookie's perspective so yeah look it's it's an interesting one but now Flick's not fighting a Charles Johnson he's not fighting an Alessandro Costa he's fighting Malcolm Gordon who's had his troubles and struggles in the UFC as well again the jury's probably out of whether Malcolm Gordon's a UFC caliber fighter but again Malcolm Gordon He's not fighting a Mokayev or a Jake Hadley here. He's fighting Jimmy Flick. So I think it's going to be a bit of a grappler's delight, this fight. I think Malcolm Gordon's the more tricky grappler. But the thing is, Flick is a good grappler himself. That's where his base is within his jiu-jitsu. Both are black belts in jiu-jitsu, I believe. So it's going to be a really good fight from that perspective. Striking-wise, I think Malcolm Gordon is probably the slightly better striker, but that's mostly because of his speed. I think he's faster on the feet, but I think Jimmy Flick's the better wrestler. So this, again, it just adds a different level of flavor to this fight. You've got Gordon that's going to be lightning fast on the fleet, on the feet, but then you've got Flick that's got good wrestling, and then once the wrestling happens, then you get the grappling, and both of them are really tricky grapplers. You look at Malcolm Gordon getting out of some really good positions against Mohamed Mokayev, but Flick has... If Flick can just continuously get his wrestling going, and even if Flick takes Gordon down and Gordon reverses a position, I think Flick can create is good enough to create the scrambles to create some re wrestling ability, some re wrestling situations and scenarios where he can get back on a single leg and look to start wrestling back on Gordon and put him back on his back. And I think that's ultimately going to be the difference in this in a fight that seems to be razor close, whichever way you look at it. I think the wrestling, the fact that they're both good grapplers. I think the fact that Gordon's going to be the better striker, but Flick's the better wrestler, is going to force Flick into wrestling. And I think that's what Flick wants to do anyway. And even, like I said, even if Gordon does reverse a position and, you know, gets Flick on his back, I think Flick's got the ability to scramble into re-wrestling scenarios. And again, we come back to the wrestling. I think the wrestling's going to make the difference in this fight. That's where Jimmy Flick's better. Malcolm Gordon can get taken down. I think Flick will get takedowns. I think he will have to re-wrestle with some you know, sweeps and reverses of positions from Gordon. But again, as I've said a couple of times now, it all keeps coming back to the wrestling. And that for me is where Flick's best and where he wants to fight as well. So for those reasons, I'm picking Jimmy Flick to win this fight. And that's all for this episode of the podcast. Got through that UFC 297. The podcast has been a little bit longer than normal, but I really like some of these fights. I think some of them deserve that extra bit of time on the breakdown. As always, thank you for tuning in. If you are listening to us on YouTube, then please subscribe to the channel. It really does help us. If you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, please head over to our YouTube as well and just drop a subscription to our channel there. It all really does 
does help. And of course, like I mentioned in the introduction, if you want to get involved, have some fun gambling, or you know, if you're a long-term gambler and you do this every week anyway, get all the content that you need from the handicapper's perspective, which is myself, and of course, Bayes AI, our UFC prediction software. It's all in one place. There's no need for multiple subscriptions, and you can grab all that at MMAplay365.com. I'm Newsom. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next weekend.